Thanks. So Senate Government Operations, it is March 25th, Thursday, and we're going to be looking at OPR bill. And um, there are a couple things that we're going to be looking at here. Um, if you can, the, we have the OPR bill, which we did a walkthrough of the other day. And then we did, um, then we did a, um, the MMA amendment. And then we have Josh Gaines and Michelle Feldman here with us um, to talk about the issues of our licenses and um, how they have collateral impact because of the, um, I mean, how our, our criminal records have collateral impact on our licensing. And I was stunned when um, in, um, I was stunned in judiciary when this was brought up. And so we thought we would do it, go through it here. So with that, um, I think that um, what we should do is start with, we did a walkthrough of, of the OPR bill the other day with um, Hal Colson. And um, do you have the MMA language for us? Yes. Okay, thanks. Can you, will you Donna, go over that with us, Amron? Yes, I would be happy to. It is posted on the webpage. Uh, for the record, Amron Abergele Legislative Council. Um, just so you are aware, you may have received two versions. We did a few. Amron, your, yes. very, your feedback or your sound is very odd. That's oh. The best way I can describe it. It's, like a, it's got a reverb. Brian would have the right name for it. I would, but it sounds perfect to me. Oh, really? I didn't notice anything. I hear what Allison's hearing. It's like a yeah. buzz. It's like sounded a buzz bad to me too. Feedback. Thank you, Keisha, for otherwise. <laughs> Others are nodding. That's. Let me try. Oh, I can hear it in mine too. Hold on. Maybe oh, my my God. things are breaking. I've been too busy. Um, hold on. Let me try unplugging. Mm. Is that any better? Yes. Yes. Okay. I unplugged and replugged. So I don't know what the problem was. <laughs> okay. Um, you may have uh, seen two versions this morning. I see Gail has a hand up. Yeah. I just wanted to let the committee know that um, the live stream is actually on the Senate agricultural channel. I tried to log out and re-log in, but it didn't happen. So it will be switched over to SGO, but for anybody who's trying to uh, find us, it is on the Senate Agricultural Committee channel. How, how would they even hear that if they're- I know, <laughs> hopefully somebody heard it and we'll pass the word along. I'm letting, I'm letting the tech people know. Oh, you're great. So I see two versions of this, Amarin, 1.3 and 1.4. Yes. So 1.3 has almost all of the substance that's in 1.4. I um, went through a few more changes uh, with Director Hibbert and her staff um, over the, the lunch break. So I have added 1.4. So you have it. What I can do is I would like to walk through 1.4 since that is the most recent version and I will just highlight if there's been a change of which it's really just a word here and there to make sure that we're consistent with our usage of words like event versus match um, and some clarifying language. Uh, so I will highlight any changes for those of you that have been, who've already done a read through of 1.3. The substance is primarily the same. These should be relatively small changes, but I will make a note of them when we come to them. Right. So draft number 1.4, this is an amendment to H289, an act relating to professions and occupations regulated by the Office of Professional Regulation. This would first, and I will pause, there are a few additional sections in here that were requested by the Office of Professional Regulation. 
Um, I will pause so that you can hear a little background from Lauren about those before we move into the uh, the mixed martial arts section, which is very large. Um, <clears throat> so the first is a change in section 122 of Title III. This is in section one of the OPR bill. You'll see that in uh, section 122, this is the Office of Professional Regulation. Within this first paragraph, you now have a change in the classification of the director from an exempt position to a classified position. And this is the only change from section one as it is uh, in H289. I will let Lauren, I, well, yeah. actually I should ask the chair how she would like to proceed. I don't know if you want to have any input on that before we continue into the mixed martial arts. Yeah, actually, let's just, um, as we go through them, make sure that, so this is a good change. I mean, this is a change that, a correct change. Lauren? For the record, Lauren Hibbert, Director of the Office of Professional Regulation. Um, Madam Chair, I do think this is a good change. The other directors within the Secretary of State are classified employees. This position um, should not be a political position. Um, which exempt positions typically are. It should be um, a state employee position. I think this wording is um, a direct reflection of the qualifications that are in the statute for the um, state archivist, um, which I think is a similar type of position, at least in my mind. It's treated the same way within the Secretary of State's office um, with great um, independence and authority, but also as a state position and a non-political position. So um, I do support this language change. I, I hope it's not controversial. Um, it does obviously directly impact me. So I feel relatively uncomfortable talking about it, but um, I do support it. And I know that the Secretary of State supports it as well. Does anybody have any questions about that? Senator Colomar? Just very quickly, Lauren, why wasn't it set up this way to begin with then? I don't know why it was originally set up as um, an exempt. What I know is that over the course of time, other um, directors within the Secretary of State's office have moved to classified. So I could, I could do the research and figure out the answer for you on when the state archivist was made a classified position. It used to be exempt. And when the elections director used to be um, exempt and then it became classified. Um, I believe that that occurred, I think, around eight years ago. But I can go back through the um, history with the team and, and figure out when those changes were made. But it's my understanding that all of these positions um, were established as exempt and then have transitioned into classified. Interestingly, the elections director is not in statute. Um, that is a position that is not created and defined within the statute. Okay. okay. Any more questions about this section? Okay. Amarin, do you want to move on? I think we're okay with this. Yes. So scrolling down to page two, <clears throat> this is the second instance of amendment, which would be striking out the effective dates section, section 15, that is currently in H289 and in and inserting new sections, sections 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Section 15 would create a new chapter within Title 26. This would be a chapter that would cover both boxing and mixed martial arts. Presently, boxing is under Title 31, and this would, you'll see later in sections uh, 16 and 17, I believe, of this would create, uh, would move boxing from Title 31 so that it is in a chapter with mixed martial arts. So that the regulation of both of those sort of similarly situated professions are within Title 26. Mm -hmm. This creates chapter 107, boxing and mi mixed martial arts. There's a space here for where subchapter one boxing will go. Subchapter two is mixed martial arts. Section 6025 outlines definitions to be used in this subchapter. Um, one of the changes from version 1.3 into this version was we added the words including an exhibition under the definition of contestant. I 
contestant means an individual who competes in a mixed martial arts match, which includes uh, an exhibition. Um, some important definitions to keep in mind as you walk through the bill, there are instances when we're talking about a match and instances when we're talking about an event. So it's important to note that event is defined as a mixed martial arts match, meaning it can just be one match, or it could be two or more mixed martial arts matches held at the same location on the same or con consecutive dates. Match is defined on page five, number five meaning any occurrence in which a mixed martial arts contestant competes against another mixed martial arts contestant using, and then we added the word in this version, mixed martial arts. As used in the subchapter, match or mixed martial arts match includes amateur matches, and then we added the words and exhibitions, just to be clear that this does not necessarily need to be um, a a match does not necessarily need to involve a competition necessarily. It may just involve an exhibition of mixed martial arts skills. <clears throat> then office uh, for this subchapter means the Office of Professional Regulation. You have participants, which are individuals who participate directly or indirectly in matches, including managers, referees, matchmakers, seconds, corners, and judges. This does not meet, this does not include spectators and audience members. Promoter means any person, club, corporation, or association, um, including any officer, director, employee of a corporate promoter, a stockholder thereof, uh, who produces, arranges, or stages any mixed martial arts match. <clears throat> Section 6026, jurisdiction of the Office of Professional Regulation. The office shall have an exercise sole discretion management control and supervision over all mixed martial arts events taking place within the state. No uh, mixed martial, I'm gonna just start saying MMA so I can stop saying mixed martial arts yeah. every time. Uh, no MMA event shall take place within the state except in accordance with the provisions of this subchapter and the rules adopted by the office. Um, since this is such a long amendment, I was planning on hitting the highlights of each section, unless, Madam Chair, we, you would like me to go more word for word. I No, I, I don't think so, because I think like the director's powers and duties and stuff are pretty consistent with other professions, right? All right, I will yes. hit, hit the highlights. Am I on then. mute? No, you are not. Oh, okay. So, so I think that, yeah, if you just hit the things okay. where it directly is different and, and affects the MMA, because that's, that's what we want to see in here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so subdivisions one and two are pretty standard um, language around powers of the director for licensing. Um, this does allow the director in subdivision three to um, administer the inspection of MMA event facilities and records associated with an event. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, fees and taxes that you will see associated with not only licenses, but taxes and bonds associated with events, which is specific to MMA, um, which, so this gives the director power to collect those. Um, and then Moving into page five, subsection B, this does set up um, advisors appointed to assist the director in performance of duties yeah. under this subchapter. May I ask a question? Um, sure. Or are, you, are we saving questions till the end? Well, is it a question? Is it a technical question? No, it's about a, the question writing. Of, yeah, it's a question about taxation. I mean, uh, I guess this is only collecting taxes rather than administering them. So I think I've answered my own question. Okay, we're not, because we aren't, we don't have the authority to, I mean, the state does, but this MMA doesn't have the authority to set taxes, but it's just collecting taxes. Lauren, do you want to? And what, why would you have a tax with a, a, a sports match? I mean, unless you sold a ticket, which... I guess is taxed, of course. So 
Um, that's a great question and one that we debated whether we should keep the word tax in the bill or um, modify it to fee. Um, this tax is used in the boxing subchapter in the same section. So we decided to keep it tax to be uniform, but it is not a tax like you and I think of taxes. It is a gate fee to be paid to the Office of Professional Regulation based on the percentage of um, sales um, to support the operation of the program. So it's not a tax, meaning it's not going to the Department of Taxes. It is going to the Office of Professional Regulation and it, it is a fee. Um, and it is called a tax because boxing has a similar structure. And for whatever reason, the statutory construction included it as a tax. Um, and I can say that some other states also refer to this um, fee based on um, income from an event um, as a tax to be paid to the organizing body. What, when we sell tickets to anything in this state, they're taxed. I mean, we sell tickets to movies, they're taxed or performing arts or, so it, would there be an additional tax, the, the, an event? Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Emren? Sure. Uh, subsection B on page five, um, the director uh, shall appoint advisors um, and adopt rules necessary to perform the director's duties. Uh, and shall establish safety standards for the protection of contestants. This is one of the changes from the last version. We inadvertently left out the word contestants. Protection of contestants, participants, promoters, and the public. Um, the next subdivisions one through nine outline all of the areas where the director must adopt a rule. Um, and so this is for conducting and holding amateur and professional MMA events, um, requirements and qualifications to be eligible for licensure for those involved in these events, requirements for the collection, retention and remission of bonds provided by promoters, requirements for promoter reports to the office. Um, this would be including reports following the MMA event and for promoter payment of the event tax. Uh, there is, you'll see there's a section about medical examinations of participants and contestants that need to take place at certain times, pre-licensure, as well as during matches, and uh, around any exemptions for certain types of mixed martial arts events, requirements around the inspection of, inspection of facilities of events and associated records. Uh, section 6028 outlines who the advisors shall be. This would be appointed by the Secretary of State. Um, both advisors shall be an individual with at least three years experience in MMA as a promoter, participant, or contestant. The appointees shall serve five staggered, excuse me, staggered five-year terms and serve at the pleasure of the Secretary. Um, as you may have seen with other advisor setups for professional regulation, the director shall seek the advice of the advisors um, when carrying out the provisions of this chapter, I should say subchapter. Sorry, every once in a while I, I catch another error. Um, and the advisors shall be entitled to compensation and necessary expenses um, for attendance at any meeting called by the director. This is standard language with other advisors in other regulated professions. Section 6029 covers amateur events. There is an exception for um, MMA events that um, are amateur MMA events conducted by a school, college, or university. And the director may, uh, by rules, exempt from application MMA events in which there is minimal or no contact between contestants. Uh, for which there is no remuneration for participation and for which no tickets are sold or admission fees charged. Okay. Everybody Section, okay so far? Mm. Yeah, I guess my one sort of like curiosity as we go along is if was this based on another state in, in some material way? Just like curious as we're reading it. Uh, Lauren? Yes, it was. Um, we looked at several states. Um, we looked at New York and New Jersey particularly, but we looked at, um, I believe, Virginia as well. 
Um, and then we looked at our existing regulation within the box. Okay. Okay. I will say I have everyone minimized, so I have this on my big screen. So please say something or interrupt because I, I won't necessarily notice if someone has a question. Yeah. <laughs> Section 6030 on page seven is uh, licensing. Subsection A, contestant license. Um, no individual shall participate as a contest contestant in a mixed martial arts event, which we clarified includes just one match um, without first obtaining a license from, the, from OPR. Um, yep. Licensure must be conducted um, according to the rules adopted by the director. A fee may be assessed. You'll see further down, there is a fees section. <clears throat> um, the director shall specify by rules how the application for licensure should go. That's in subdivision four on the top of page eight. Licenses shall be renewed every year on a date set by the director. And subsection B is concerns medical examinations. Each contestant shall be examined by a physician who's licensed under uh, chapters 23 or 33 of Title 26 at the time and in accordance with rules adopted by the director. And no contestant shall be granted a license or permitted to renew a license without first submitting a report from a physician um, who performed the examination in accordance with rules, certifying the contestant is an appropriate physical condition to engage in a mixed martial arts event. Uh, reports from an examining physician must be submitted directly to OPR by the examining physician and shall contain information that, the, um, that is required by rule. <clears throat> uh, subdivision three, no contestant shall participate in an MMA match unless the contestant has been examined not more than 12 hours before the match by a physician. Uh, the physician who performed the examination must certify in writing to the referee of the match that the contestant is in appropriate physical condition to engage in an MMA match. And then subdivision four, fees for the pre-match examination shall be paid by the promoter of the match. In addition to providing the certification to the referee on the day of the event, the contestant must also submit the certification of the examining physician to the office uh, to OPR within 48 hours following the match. Okay. Section 6031, promoters. This is similar to the contestant licensure section we just went through. No person may hold or conduct an MMA event uh, without first obtaining a license to do so from OPR or a license to be a promoter, I should say. Um, a person who wants to be licensed shall apply in the manner specified uh, by the director in rules. Licenses shall be renewed every two years. Um, in addition to the bond required under this subchapter, a fee may be obsessed, may be assessed for a promoter license. Before any promoter license is granted, the applicant shall file, shall execute and file with OPR a bond to the state in the amount of $10,000 to be conditioned upon the faithful performance by the applicant of the provisions of this subchapter and the payment of the taxes imposed under the subchapter. Um, and no promoter license uh, may be renewed unless the bond has been renewed and filed with the board. Subsection B, you'll see there's also an event license so that no MMA event, which includes just one match, may be held by a promoter unless the promoter has an obtained an event license from OPR to hold the event. And that must be obtained at least two weeks prior to the first day of the event. Uh, the form of the application and information required will be established uh, by OPR by rule. A fee may be assessed for this match or event license. You'll see we go through 6033 uh, further down, which outlines fees. A no event license shall be granted to any promoter who is not licensed in the state 
or whose license is suspended, disciplined, or revoked in any other state or jurisdiction, or who is delinquent in paying a tax that has been assessed pursuant to section 6039 of this subchapter. No event license shall be granted until OPR performs an inspection of the MMA event facilities and um, inspection of records associated with the event. No event license. Uh, oh, we have an error here. I will take that out. This should read a separate event license shall be obtained for each event, including for a sole match. Right. Sorry, this must have been during our uh, revisions over lunch. I fear I may have missed something. Are we all okay up to this point? I just want to make sure so that we don't have to go back over. As far as I can tell, I'm astounded at the length. Uh, I know, I am too. I thought this was going to take about five minutes. Yeah. So I really <laughs> apologize here to Josh. More and to it than we thought. I agree. What? what did you say? It had, has a lot more to it than we thought. So I'm uh, apologizing to Josh and Michelle here because I thought this portion of it would take about really about 10 minutes. So oh, well. we'll, keep, we'll keep going through it and we'll get to you. Um, but we have other things on our agenda today too. So I'm not sure how we'll, how we'll manage this, but we will figure it out. Okay. All right, Amarin, do you want to? Yes, and I apologize, I confused myself. This is the one instance when it, a license may not be renewed. Um, so subdivision five is correctly worded. No event license may be renewed. Um, you need to have a separate event license for each event. Yeah. Um, and that would include a sole match. Section 6032, participants. Uh, no individual shall participate either directly or indirectly. Um, in the state without having first obtained a license from OPR. There is uh, subsection B on page 12. A fee may be assessed for a participant license. Subsection C, every participant licensed um, shall be subject to the rules adopted by the director. <clears throat> um, the form and manner of the application shall be specified by the director in rules. And subdivision two, licenses shall be renewed every two years on a date set by the director Let, by rule. Licensees shall be subject to the provisions of this subchapter and all rules. Section 6033 fees, which we have, I have mentioned several times. Uh, you'll see this outlines various fees for application. We have a promoter license fee, an event license fee, a contestant license fee, a participant license fee, and then moving on to page 13, biennial renewal for managers, seconds, referees, and judges, biennial renewal for promoters, annual renewal for contestants, and then lastly, any late fees um, set pursuant to 3 VSA 127 D1. I have a question real quick. Yep. Um, are these fees the same or different for amateur fights versus professional fights? Lauren? I believe the fees are the same. There's not a differentiation in the statute. Okay. So we'll have gate fees even for amateur fights. Okay. Okay. All right, moving on to section 6034 on page 13 renewal of licenses. General provisions, a licensee shall apply to renew the license prior to the expiration of the current license. The director is required to send a reminder to licensees prior to the expiration of their licenses. The office may charge, in addition to the license fee, a late fee to licensees who do not apply um, until after their license is expired. In terms of deadlines, uh, Subdivision one, licenses for participants and promoters shall be renewed every two years upon payment of the required fees. Subdivision two, licenses for contestants shall be renewed every year upon payment of the required fees. And, and that's it for that section. Uh, on page 14, uh, section 6035, medical insurance. Promoters licensed um, 
in accordance with this subchapter shall carry medical insurance covering all contestants who participate in an event uh, conducted by the promoter. The cost of the medical insurance, including deductibles and premiums shall be borne by the promoter. The promoter shall obtain medical insurance coverage in an amount to be determined by the director uh, by rule. And that coverage shall cover the expenses for the treatment of any injuries the contestant may suffer as a result of an MMA event. The medical insurance coverage shall extend for at least six months following the date of the MMA event. No MMA event shall be approved in the state unless the promoter is in full compliance with the requirements of this section concerning uh, medical insurance coverage. Are we all okay? Okay. Section 6036 at the bottom of page 14, medical exam. The director shall adopt rules for medical examination of contestants and participants, including examinations before, during, and after a match or event, and as a condition of licensure. Yep. Section 6037, referees. No MMA event shall take place without a referee present and overseeing the event. The sole arbiter in the ring in a mixed martial arts match shall be the referee licensed as a participant in Vermont who shall govern the match in accordance with rules adopted by the director. The referee shall have the full power to stop the match whenever the referee deems it advisable because of the physical condition of a contestant when one of the contestants is clearly outclassed by an opponent or for other reasonable cause. Okay, everybody okay with that? Yes, I, I'm so glad we have our own SGO referee here. This is a, a, another opportunity for refereeing, Brian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the director comes up with the rules. I'm a little bit, wouldn't, they, wouldn't the people that run MMA, that's like, okay, Lauren, help me. Um, it's an excellent question. I know absolutely nothing about MMA. Um, so it would be shocking if I wrote the, the rules in isolation. Uh, that's not what would happen. Um, the two advisors um, who are appointed help the office write the rules. And then obviously the rules go through the um, legislative rulemaking process um, and have lots of opportunities for public comment from the community. So um, the rules are not written by me um, individually. Um, they are written always in all of our advisor professions with the advice of the advisors and then um, promulgated through the rulemaking process with opportunities for public comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Medical assistance. Section 6038, the bottom of page 15. Um, every promoter shall have an attendance at every MMA match, at least one physician. The physician shall perform medical examinations of the contestants not more than 12 hours before the beginning of the match and shall certify in writing to the referee whether or not the contestant is in appropriate physical condition to engage in an MMA match. B, ambulance. Every promoter shall have at every MMA match an ambulance containing the standard medical equipment necessary to treat cerebral injuries. If the ambulance leaves an event, no other MMA match may commence or resume until the ambulance returns. The promoter shall stop or delay a match until an ambulance is present. Subsection C, upon the recommendation of the physician present during an MMA event, a contestant shall be required to undergo an ophthalmological and neurological examination after each match in accordance with rules adopted under this subchapter. Uh, the cost of that examination shall be borne by the promoter. The physician shall, shall provide a certified writing of the examination findings to the referee and the contestant. Within 48 hours after receiving the examination, uh, the contestant shall submit the physician certified writing to the office. If the physician, after an examination, certifies that the contestant is not in a physical condition to engage in an MMA match, the contestant shall not be permitted to engage in another match until a subsequent examination is conducted. Um, and a, cert a physician certifies that the contestant is in an appropriate physical condition to engage in an MMA match. The physician providing the subsequent examination does not need to be the same physician who provided the exam at the match. So I, I do have a question about that. Does the, in um, A, does it, the physician who does the 12 hour 
um, exam have to be the same physician as the one that's actually at the match? They do not have to be the same. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm, I'm actually confused a little bit about the, uh, the two different exams. Is there, like, are, are we doing one the day before? Usually the exams are done the day of. In my experience, when we've done it, it's always been the day of. Um, that's when we, that, uh, usually a couple hours before the fight, the, we have this, the physician go down and he checks all the fighters. They have to, he checks their eyes, make sure they're not concussed or anything like that before going into the fight. Do we have to have two, are you saying we have to have two different examinations? I read this that it's not more than 12 hours before. So it could be the, an hour before. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's just to make sure that they're, yeah. that they can fight, that they're not hurt, yeah. injured. And yeah. Do okay. I read that right? Lauren and Amarin, it's not more than 12 hours. So it could be the, just done right there at the. Right. Okay. That is what the wording says right now. Yes. Sorry, I was yeah. looking for, at the wording and trying to unmute at the same time. It was confusing. Okay. May I ask a question, Madam Chair? Yep. So do we have any other sport in Vermont that requires this amount of medical attention and an ambulance standing by? I mean, it. this is... <coughs> um, motor vehicle racing has similar um, constraints on what's available at the time of the race. Um, boxing <coughs> has some of this within it as well. Um, and then those are regulated sports. Um, I think most team sports do have medical staff mm -hmm. Um, on standby, but it's not a regulated activity. Um, because the state is regulating this, um, has determined that there is potential for public harm. The intent of this statute is to provide the structure around which um, the state would feel comfortable with these matches happening. That's the lens in which um, any regulation should be viewed. Is this necessary to protect the public right. under chapter 57? Right, no, I remember that's your mantra. And um, yeah, I suppose we regulate many things that potentially cause harm, driving for one. Well, but this is, this is a profession that's being regulated. And, and when we, I, I mean, you asked about other sports events and car racing, but in, and we don't regulate high school sports. That's done by the principals association, but or the school headmasters association. But um, most of them, when I have gone to them, they have um, an athletic trainer or a doctor right there. They don't necessarily always have an ambulance, but um, yeah, I think you're right. Um, Hockey and football normally do have emergency personnel on duty at the mm -hmm. field. Um, yeah. So I think okay. it falls in line with, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine with it. Okay, all right, let's go on to the tax, the post-event report. All right. Section 6039 on page 17, tax post-event report by promoter. Every promoter shall not later than seven days after the conclusion of an MMA event, submit a post-event report to OPR in accordance with rules adopted by OPR. The report shall include the exact number of tickets to the event sold, the amount of gross receipts from the event, and any other facts as the director may require by rule. The promoter shall report on tickets sold to an entire event, not to an individual match within an event. Uh, Every, oh, I'm missing a subsection. Sorry, one moment. Every promoter shall not later than seven days after the conclusion of an MMA event pay to OPR by certified check a tax of 5% of the gross receipts from the sale of tickets and admission fees exclusive of any federal tax thereon. The promoter shall pay the tax on the gross receipts from the entire event. This tax shall be deposited in the professional regulation fee fund and used to carry out the provisions of this subchapter. I need to redesignate the following, the next section as subsection C, not D. 
um, if the report required under this section and the accompanying tax are not paid within the seven days required, the office may examine or cause to be examined the books and records of the promoter and any corporation on behalf of which the promoter held the event. Okay. Right. Moving on to section 6040, unprofessional conduct. <clears throat> This would require that all persons licensed under this subchapter are subject to uh, Title III, Chapter 5, Subchapter 3, including the unprofessional conduct items established under Section 129A of Title III. In addition to the items set forth in Title III, Section 129A, it shall be unprofessional conduct for a contestant to do any of the following. First, engage in a an MMA match after a physician certifies um, following an exam, uh, following an annual exam or an examination before, during, or within seven days after a match um, that the contestant is not in a physical condition to engage in an MMA match. Subdivision two, engage in a, an MMA match when suspended. And then in this version, we added or prohibited from competing in an MMA match by any entity that regulates MMA. Three, engage in an MMA match when the contestant's license um, as a contestant, promoter, or participant is suspended in any other state or jurisdiction. Four, engage in an MMA match less than 30 days after competing as a contestant in another MMA match. Five, engage in an MMA match less than 60 days after having been knocked out in an MMA match or less than 30 days after having been technically knocked out in an MMA match. And I learned that those terms, knocked out and technically knocked out, are terms of art that will be described uh, in rule. And yes, six. a TKO. <laughs> right. we, we all know TKOs <laughs> if we watch boxing. <laughs> And six, any other activity as, as established by the director in rule. Uh, subsection C is around unprofessional conduct of promoters. It shall be unprofessional conduct for a promoter to, one, fail to submit a required report or information to OPR within the um, required time period, and, inc uh, and including the information, we added the word taxes in this version, since it was missing, uh, taxes and fees required under this subchapter. Two, directly or indirectly have any financial interest in an individual competing in an MMA match arranged by the promoter. Three, engage a contestant who is suspended or prohibited from competing in, an MM, in MMA matches by any state or jurisdiction to, uh, to compete in a match held by the promoter. Four, conduct an, an MMA match with no ambulance, conduct a match with no physician present, or conduct a match without a referee present or any other activity as established by the director by rule. Uh, sub section D, unprofessional conduct of participants. It shall be unprofessional conduct for a participant to do any of the following. One, for a referee to unreasonably fail to comply with the rules adopted by the director for the conduct of an MMA match. Two, for a referee, matchmaker, or judge to directly or indirectly have any financial interest in a person competing in an MMA match uh, at which the referee, matchmaker, or judge is acting as a judge, matchmaker, or referee. Three, any other activity as established by the director by rule. Are we okay with that so far, everybody? Yeah. Okay. Inspection. I, I see a hand. Oh, I just have a quick. I just have a quick question. It says that you can only be in a match every thirty days. Is that it says you can't engage in a match in, in, other than thirty days after another match? Um. Yes, that is what it says. Right. Oh, yeah. The bottom yep. of page eighteen. Yep. I that is what think, it says. Okay. I, I know that's what it says. I just find it interesting. I mean, so, so that's I, pretty normal. It is. Okay. I just surprised. I mean, it seems like you have a match on Saturday and then you can have another match the following Saturday, but you can't do that. You need time to recover. Yeah, I bet. 
So back in the old days, that's what they used to do. You could, you would just go to one match after another match after another match. But um, the matches today, it's pretty common knowledge. You don't fight for at least 30 days, no matter if you took no injuries or not. You need that 30 days for your body after you've been in a fight camp just to completely recover. So there's more to the just being punched is the whole going through the fight camp. So you, you need that 30 days. Okay. I mean, I, I was just surprised, but it's fine. Okay. <clears throat> Inspections. Did I lose somebody? Cameron, you're muted. Oh, you lost me. I'm sorry. I was muted. <laughs> uh, section 6041 on page 20, inspections. The director or designee may inspect facilities, including the ring, where an MMA match is to be held before or during a match or event, and the records required for each licensee and the event or match in accordance with this subchapter and rules adopted by the office. Uh, the director or designee may suspend an event license immediately for failure to comply with this subchapter or any uh, applicable rules. Uh, now I have a new section. I don't see any questions. We are almost finished with this MMA section, actually. Uh, section 6042, age. No individual under 18 years of age shall engage in a mixed martial arts event, including a sole match in which money, a prize or purse, or other form of monetary compensation is offered or given to any contestant. And Okay. And section 6043, injunction, the director may, in addition to other remedies available under law, bring an action in a court of the state to enjoin a person from continuing any violation of this subchapter or doing any acts in furtherance thereof and for any other relief that the court deems appropriate. All right, so I think we're done with MMA. Yeah. <clears throat> and does, um, we're all okay with it? The only thing I don't, I think it's super expensive. I think there's a lot of fees and taxes. It's going to be, it's going to be really expensive for a promoter to put on a show because our venues are super small up here. You know, the, I'm, I've got one of the bigger venues, but the only other one is down in um, Rutland, the Spartan arena. You're not going to, you're not going to have a small events anymore. They're going to have to be large events in order to cover all the fees. Okay. We can, um, this isn't, we will be doing OPR again um, next week, I believe it is. And so um, we can just debate whether those are the right fees at that time. No worries. Yeah, no, I think that that's a good observation. And our, can I just ask if the rest of this is technical? The boxing section? The boxing section, the two sections, you'll see them here. This is all of the boxing sections um, on the bottom of this page is just redesignation and conforming changes. And then I will say there is an additional section 18 on page 22, which slightly amends the uniform process for endorsement from other states. Uh, this was a, a separate request from OPR that adds um, you'll see on page 22, it adds it within subdivision A, notwithstanding any statute or rule to the contrary, and except as provided in subdivision B, all professions attached to the office shall have an endorsement process that requires not more than three years of practice in good standing in another jurisdiction of the United States. Um, and that is the but only this other. Isn't, this isn't just for MMA. This is no, that's unrelated. Everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. This was something, um, as you likely remember, Madam Chair, that came out of the legislation that we did last year yep. on streamlining licensure, um, the uniform endorsement process. That we didn't expressly, in the language, um, add something like the notwithstanding any statute okay. or rule. So as we're going through the implementation, getting ready to um, activate this um, for April 1st, we are realizing that there are statutes that um, prescribe seven years of practice in another state. And without this addition, it's a, um, it's a barrier to legally um, 
to um, enacting a uniform endorsement standard. So that's why we're asking for this language to be included um, to clearly state that the intent of the legislature is to overrule, for lack of a better word, any other statute or rule that's in effect in any profession under OPR. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. <clears throat> so any questions on, on this? So what I would suggest is that um, maybe if uh, um, Lauren and Rex, if you can talk between now and the next time we take this up and um, just to make sure that um, we, we get the right fees in there, but we, the fees aren't so high that we eliminate maybe smaller events because of the smallness of our state. And then I have, I'm gonna tell you when I'm thinking about putting this on again. No, I'm not because I don't have it down here. So I, I'm not going to, but it won't be, I don't think it will be next week. It will be the next week. Okay. So any questions That'll give us about- give some time. Huh? That'll give us some time. Yeah. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I want to be fair. I mean, obviously we need to have a commission and it has to be paid for. There's got to be fees to pay for it. Um, but we don't want to, I don't want to alienate every other small person trying to do this either. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> All right. So what I'm going to suggest committee is that, um, and help me figure this out here. We have, um, we had on our list we had um, looking at H10 at 3.30, S50 at 4, and S73 at 4.30. I don't think that any of those will necessarily take half an hour to do a walkthrough. I know S73 won't. And I don't think H10 will. I know we have some people who want to testify on H10 and um, S50 um, would just be a, a brief walkthrough, but we can always um, come back to that next week. I'm wondering here because we have um, Joshua and um, Michelle who've joined us and I would like us to, so if this is okay with everybody out there in the, um, I see we have Kate and we have our representative Gannon with us on these, on the other issues, representative Gannon, are you here on which one? Um, Madam Chair, I'm here on H10. Okay. So I'm going to suggest that we, and Kate, you are too, right? Okay. So what I'm going to suggest is that we um, have the presentation from Josh and Michelle first um, while we have OPR here. And because this is, this is a really interesting um, presentation and then we'll do more work on it afterwards. Is that okay with everybody? What? How long is your presentation? It was about 15 minutes or so, I think when you did it in in judiciary, am I right? I think it was much longer than that, but we, we've we certainly made an effort to trim it down <laughs> for you today. Uh, it'll be long in judiciary. Yeah. Yes, it'll be under 15 minutes. We, we oh, will okay. short and sweet and we could- um, and, and and which bill are you presenting? No, um, we are looking at, um, I thought I explained this before, we we're looking at OPR bill. I mean, oh, we're looking this at- This continues on the OPR bill. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. I thought you, given your discussion of the others, I thought we were shifting, but we're still- okay. no, I wanted to put off the others for a few minutes so that we can hear this um, presentation. And it isn't on this bill itself, but it is about OPR and how- our, well, I'm not going to explain it. That just takes more time because I'll let Josh and Michelle explain it. And, and then <clears throat> we know we have to do that. This is going to take more work, that this isn't just a slam dunk that's going to be done in one bill, but it will set the stage for us to be working on this. So if you'd like to take it away, the two of you. Sure. I can start. And thank you so much, Senator White, for having us here and 
Um, it's great to talk to everyone. And I'm Michelle Feldman. I'm a program director at Council for State Governments Justice Center. Um, and like our name says, we're a member organization of state governments across the country. Um, and this is really, I hope, a starting point um, on access to professional licenses for justice impacted people. Um, and I know you were hearing, you know, about a slightly different issue related to licensing, um, but, you know, it's related to the overall topic of occupational licensing, which can be, you know, a pathway to a good paying career for many people. But unfortunately, people with criminal records that were long into their past can still be impacted and that could still be a roadblock um, for them to move on and you know, obtain economic mobility. Um, and just to give you a little context, um, so occupational licensing in general is a big issue that Council for State Governments has addressed. Um, in 2017, we um, staffed a uh, an occupational licensing consortium um, that the Department of Labor um, really was behind, um, bringing together 16 states and Vermont was among them. And the goal was to have states come together to talk about um, you know, ways to ease restrictions that ensure access to work while at the same time you know, protecting professionalism and safety um, you know, in the licensing process. And, you know, one of the areas was um, about people with criminal records. They were identified as one of the groups that was hardest hit by unclear or outdated licensing restrictions. And then fast forward to today, um, CSG Justice Center is leading a national initiative to help states as they grapple with the economic challenges of the pandemic. Um, on different economic mobility issues and specifically fair chance licensing for people with criminal records. So we have you know, done an assessment of every state's laws as they pertain to occupational licensing access um, for people who have convictions. And um, in so many states, there's really a, a roadblock um, for people who have a criminal past and even when that person you know has served their time even if the offense had nothing to do with the occupation that they're seeking even if they've gone through the education and training um just having that criminal record alone can be a basis either to deter them from taking the next step or for them to be denied by the boards because the boards, you know, they also need guidance and clarity about how to assess a criminal record. Um, and over half the states in the country today have adopted a set of best practices to improve consistent, consistent, consistency and clarity um, of how boards should consider criminal convictions and ensuring that they're not just looking at that record, they're looking at the individual as a whole. Um, you know, what have they done to rehabilitate themselves? Um, you know, have they had subsequent convictions? Um, you know, kind of really looking at the full picture of the person. Um, and Vermont has adopted some best practices. Um, there is a statute that allows people to get a, a pre-application determination. Um, so before they go through the whole process of getting education and training, they will know if their conviction disqualifies them. Um, and OPR actually has a great policy um, that provides guidance. Um, but the problem is OPR, there are still some professions that it doesn't provide licenses to. And um, just codifying those best practices a way, is a way to ensure that, you know, when there's change in the agency, you know, best practices will remain in place. So really adopting best practices and looking at what some other states have done is a way to get people back to work and get the economy moving and also ensuring that it's an inclusive economic recovery because you know people of color are disproportionately impacted by the criminal justice system and then that perpetuates um, you know when their records are then used to deny them uh, economic opportunities and 
Also, employment is shown to reduce recidivism, strengthen public safety, and save public money that's spent on incarceration. So it's really you know, a win-win for everybody to take a close look at this. And Josh Gaines is, you know, the expert on all states <laughs> licensing regulations. And I will turn it over to him to get into some of the details. But thank you, Michelle, Senator Clarkson. Did you yeah, I just want to say that all of us are subject to our attorney general's favorite mantra, speaking of mantras today, which is the best public safety is a good paying job. So all of us have heard TJ say that 88 times. So we're, we're, we're pretty clear. I that's great. Very consistent with what the, well, what this goal is. Thank you. So Josh. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you uh, to the chairperson and the committee for in inviting us here today. Um, as the chairperson mentioned, this is kind of a, a, a continuation of a conversation that we began in the Judiciary Committee, and I kind of went through, uh, you know, the be what the best practices are in the states and sort of where Vermont lands. And I think the feedback I got, which is consistent with what I'm, you know, was able to see from the outside looking into Vermont is that Vermont is doing very well on these issues. And, and um, you know, that OPR, uh, Director Hibbert is doing a lot of the stuff that we say that every state should be doing. And when I say that every state should be doing, I should clarify, we're not advocates. We consider ourselves, um, you know, a resource for the states and, and we, you know, speak in terms of best practices, you know, what, what we're seeing uh, the states incorporate into their laws. And, and, and as far as practice goes, Vermont seems very much to be in line. Um, but when you look at the statutes, there seems to be a disconnect um, between what is codified and what is actually taking place um, in the department uh, when people's uh, uh, criminal convictions are being considered. Um, so I just wanna preface it by that. I, I, I know when I spoke to this at, uh, uh, in judiciary, it maybe seemed a little bit shocking because uh, it seemed like this stuff was already being done, but just as a matter of, of statute, I'd, I'd kind of like to walk through, through what's there. Um, the first thing is that uh, uh, licensing bodies are given uh, under uh, section 129A, which was referenced uh, as the unprofessional conduct uh, touch point in that MMA uh, amendment. Uh, they're given broad authority to deny, to deny applicants with convictions that are related to the practice of the uh, profession or for any felony, regardless of its relation to the practice of the profession. There are no time limits on that. Um, you know, there's no exceptions for minor offenses anything like that. Um, and although the department uh, may not actually be right, you know, expansively using that discretionary authority to deny people, uh, it can have a real deterrent effect on people who are considering licensure who may have a criminal past. And what we hear, you know, universally, we were talking to uh, people, or I was, I was talking to some folks in, in Utah and, and their director today, um, is, is that people are always surprised when they tell them that they can get licensure with a conviction. Um, and so when these broad sort of, you know, expansive statutory authorizations to disqualify people are out there, that really, really, um, you know, tends to, tends to tamp down on, on workers seeking these opportunities and, and pursuing them. And I'll note, of course, uh, Michelle mentioned, and I'm sure you're familiar uh, with the pre-qualification, the pre-eligibility determination um, that was enacted last year. And that's obviously, a, you know, a great step in that direction, but um, it's still somewhat of a black box in Vermont. Uh, you know, you, you can, fill out that application, you can get that determination. But before you fill it out, you generally don't know where you stand, right? So there's no kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably good or I'm not, or it's worth doing or it's not worth doing. Um, and, you know, a lot of states spell things out like this. They say, fundamentally, every licensing body has to make a determination about whether your specific conviction is directly related to the licensed activity, which is something that Vermont lacks. It has it grants authority to disqualify when it is, right? But there's no prohibition on disqualifying when it's not. Then the question becomes, how do you make that determination? And 
Um, Vermont uh, 13 VSA section 8008, this was enacted long ago as part of the Collateral Consequences of Conviction Act. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, um, but you know, says you can't disqualify somebody from anything due to a conviction without giving them individualized consideration. So that exists in Vermont, but, but what that looks like is, is unclarified. And I think the department based on, you know, what I've seen and I guess the informal policy um, says that they give everyone individualized consideration and they do it consistently. And that's really important. And that's what most states have done. They say you have to consider things like the nature of the offense, time since conviction, age of the person, and then most importantly, evidence of rehabilitation or treatment that they've sought, right? So it's really about creating a standard and then creating guidance in the statute that ensures consistency, transparency, and that arms the applicant or the prospective licensee or the, or the worker, however you wanna look at it, with the information to make informed decisions. Um, you know, about how they can proceed and ultimately expand, um, you know, access to work uh, through doing that. So having said that, I think those are, you know, kind of the big, big statutory gaps that we've, uh, you know, looked at in terms of best practices. There are a few more that I'll address that we don't see in Vermont, um, and I'll do this really quickly, um, that we see in other states. Um, like I said, limiting consideration of low level or older convictions. There are many states that either create a presumption of rehabilitation after seven years or takes, you know, certain offenses out of consideration after a number of years. Uh, I use seven just as an example. That's, you know, tends to be where things hover in other states. Um, limitation on consideration of low level offenses. There are many states that say we're taking nonviolent misdemeanors off the table, for example. Um, a lot of states require that there be a written explanation of the reasons why a conviction was disqualifying provided to the applicant. That's great because it, it you know, is almost an enforcement mechanism. It ensures accountability um, from the licensing bodies, right? You can't write that written explanation unless you go through the you know, analysis required by the statute, which it sounds like the office is already doing. Um, but a lot of states do it in the way, well, you get that notice. It's, it's not a denial. It's an intent to deny. You see that, you know what the issues are, and then you can submit information about mitigating circumstances, about rehab, you, you know, your rehabilitation, um, and then get a final determination after you've you know, had ability, the ability to address those. Um, and then listing disqualifying offenses, uh, which is pretty simple conceptually, but in practice, uh, could be more difficult, right? So this is, you know, a lot of states have said you have to, you know, each board says, these are the offenses we're going to consider, you know, a violation of section 22A or 22B, um, and everything else is off the table, right? Obviously, you know, getting that list together, and that's not a, a, a hard, right, disqualification. That's just, if you don't have one of these offenses, we don't care. If you do, we're going to walk through this analysis and give you individualized consideration. Um, you know, the advantages of that uh, that we've heard from, from many licensing bodies is, and, and really to a lot of these, um, limitations on, uh, uh, you, you know, lookbacks in terms of number of years and lower level offenses, is it's less that the licensing bodies have to deal with. They don't have to look at every criminal conviction. They don't have to consider it if it's not within those categories. Um, it's, it's a non-issue. So, you know, from an efficiency per, uh, perspective, that's good, but it also, you know, increases access. Um, and I think, you know, the last thing I really want to point out is public safety. I know we're talking about increasing access and, and that's a big motivator here, but public safety is the touchstone of all of this. And it's really, it's not about giving everyone a license regardless of the risk they may pose. It's about making sure that you're codifying the standards that allow uh, regulators to make those important public safety determinations um, because they're not, and, and please forgive me, uh, uh, director, but criminologists, and those are tough decisions to make, right? And, and doing them consistently and doing them with confidence um, can be very difficult and can have a, have a chilling effect, if, if not in Vermont, certainly, certainly in other states. Um, so that's that's kind of the general breakdown of how we look at it. And, and if we have any time, I'd, I'd love to answer any questions or, or hear any feedback you might have. Yeah, does anybody have any questions right now? I, I think I, I 
invited them to come because when we had the presentation, the numbers that were presented to us were stunning. I just, I almost fell off my chair. In fact, Senator Sears told me to shut my mouth because I, my jaw had dropped. Um, and so but, I thought I didn't Jennifer, know if there were any. What do you mean the numbers up? The numbers like there are 97 places in the statutes oh, that right. say that. that that kind of thing that that either uh, don't put any kind of a time limit on it or that are discretionary. And um, so I started thinking about it and wondering if there were any kind of overall things that we could do as part of the OPR bill this year. And I, I, don't, I that well, clearly we're not gonna get there today, but if there are um, overall things that we can do to move in this direction. And I know Lauren has been very clear um, and Colin before her, very clear about um, making sure that we don't um, deny licenses when we don't need to. So, um, but we, we also don't know who the next director might be. And the, um, when discretion is allowed, that could be scary for people. So, uh, Senator Rahm? Yeah, and Lauren might want to say something too. So this is a question to her anyway. You know, I'm very sympathetic to this issue and, and would like to see it advance. Um, this is another area where I feel like it would be really good if OPR isn't already collecting demographic data to see who is being denied a license now, you know, who, if we make this change, would be more likely to receive a license. I, I'm hoping that we, I think that also helps challenge any future concerns that get raised that we're letting dangerous people engage in, you know, professions that sketch people out or whatever. So I would just really like to hear how we're tracking, you know, a lot of demographics to know that this could make a difference. So Lauren. Hi, thank you so much. Um, this is an issue that I feel extremely passionate about um, and extremely proud of what we've already done through the consortium work um, and uh, personally very passionate about. So um, I'm open to the conversation. Um, certainly, I do want to make sure that folks know that we have a written determination. We call it a pre-denial. Um, that an applicant is given, and then they have a full hearing with due process, and that that denial of a license is appealable um, to the Supreme Court. So there's a robust um, due process right to the denial of a license. It's not done per se, and um, within all of our applications, we have um, soon to be 50 professions with the um, addition of well drillers. Um, so within all of our professions, we ask for both the convictions, but also any mitigating um, evidence or evidence of rehabilitation that's built into our application. Now, um, I, I do hear the concern that it's not um, openly on our website and not reflected in our statutes. And that's something um, that I'm open to explore. Um, in terms of demographic area, um, demographic information, we, we have taken the position, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, um, of not collecting uh, data about race or gender. Um, so we don't ask those questions. We don't ask race, gender, sex in our application process. Um, in part, um, it's not, we have not seen it as relevant to our determination of whether or not somebody's qualified for a licensure. Um, and um, sex and gender can change and is, is fluid. So we have um, really taken the position to, that we don't collect either of those data points. We collect age, we collect um, social, if you have one, um, we collect education, but we have not um, taken that um, data point. Again, it's something that we could talk about whether we should change. I will say that for all of our healthcare professionals, they have to do a survey through the Department of Health um, called the Health Care Provider Survey. And that does collect that data. And that gave us some um, 
because we're not the primary um, collector of demographic data in the state, we felt comfortable not making that, that part of our um, application process. I, I, I am a little confused as to why why it would be helpful to have that data on your application because we're talking about people who actually don't either don't apply or get denied because of a, a criminal conviction and that um, that should be regardless of race or gender if somebody is uh, is denied because they have a felony in um, I, I mean, I guess, I guess I'm not sure why, how we would collect that data or how we would use it because we're talking about people who either don't apply or feel they can't apply and we wouldn't know who, who they are. Well, I mean, right, right now we don't because we haven't tried to collect that data before to see if there's a significant sea change when these changes are made and you see if you have a you know more diverse group of people who end up getting the licensure than those you know than previously so you can't compare to past years when you haven't made these changes um but i i would also just say you know um we ran into this with department of labor we don't want to mix you know someone's identity information with a determination about their um you know their uh employ whether or not they receive um, unemployment benefits. I would really challenge that. You know, I think it's really important to collect demographic information. There are ways to do it, you know, post um, submission, et cetera, so that it's really clear it's um, not required and that it's for demographic de identified purposes. Um, but I think it's really valuable information for the state to have and for decision makers to have. I, I can't disagree with you. Um, I am barred in three states, so I, um, I'm a licensee. <laughs> and one of the states that I am barred in sends a demographic um, uh, survey with um, my app renewal every year. And it, it talks about um, where, what type of place I work, um, sexuality, gender identification, um, certainly race, um, class. Um, it's, it's very interesting to fill out. Um, and from a data perspective, I, I think it does make sense. It's just something that we haven't done, um, particularly because the, again, the Department of Health does that for all of our healthcare providers, um, provides that survey. Um, in terms of who we're not receiving applications for, I, I think we're in our beta stages, but through the grant, um, through the Federal Department of Labor grant, the consortium, we ha do have a web page specific to um, individuals with criminal backgrounds. We're trying to flesh that out. Um, we are about to have um, a video on our website about our process for um, specifically people who are foreign trained, um, people with criminal backgrounds um, and military spouses and families um, as further outreach. But um, we're, we're doing our best to be um, open to all um, and trying to encourage people to apply whenever we can. Just, just what did you mean by class? You said they, um, socioeconomic class. And how how do we? Everyone. There's every, questions every, about um, on the Colorado bar survey. There's questions about your annual salary. I assume they're doing an analysis of where what type of practice area you are, um, what your annual salary is, and um, your race class. I think that's very interesting because how I, how, I mean, my, my salary, my yearly salary is so low that I would fall in a poverty class, but I don't consider myself right. um, somebody who is, who has come from or, or came from, but who right. currently lives in poverty. But right. so I believe the questions are are related to income and are you the first um, gener first generation to go to graduate school college? So I don't they didn't yeah. So interesting. Allison. So class and income are two different issues. I mean they're completely different uh, at to go to Jeanette's point. 
Uh, I'm glad you anticipated my question, uh, Lauren, because my question was, what are we doing about outreach and educating the population we want to affect? And um, that we need to do two things, clearly. We need to fix our statutes in the areas we need to fix them. And I think we're all supportive of that. And I think we also need to do education and outreach big time because uh, we can't necessarily wait for them to come to us or to your website. How would they, but so, it was great that you um, mentioned that. Thank you. And thank you, Josh and Michelle, for giving us this charge. You know, just when we think we're doing pretty well, we're always reminded we have more to do. Yes. And I just wanted to add, there are a number of states that require data collection on how many people apply for licenses that have criminal records and how many are denied. Um, and we're happy to share some of that with yeah. You know, um, I think it's been helpful for states to see, you know, what the reality has been with, you know, once they passed best practices, how that's played out. And I'll just, if I can quickly say on, on that point, the one of the things that becomes apparent when we talk about deterrence and talk about data collection, right, you don't know who's not applying. They're, they're never in the system. Um, and that can be a problem. And lots of times when we ask, um, or not when we ask, but when we get you know data on denials from states, there are very few denials, um, right? And that's probably yeah, it looks like the the case in Vermont. Um, and still, there are all of these people walking around who think they can't get a license because they have a conviction. So the the website that's currently up there is is fantastic, and I, I've used that you know as a model. Um, when talking to other states, and and there are states that kind of by statute if if this is anything of interest, actually require that such information be posted online. Um, but I, I think the larger context is about meeting people where they are to say, hey, you can, you can do this. There's, there's nothing necessarily stopping you regardless, you know, so. I, I think that uh, if we're talking about people with convictions here, the a couple places to start and make sure we are doing outreach is in the Department of Corrections, Probation and Parole, and um, our um, community justice centers around, um, because <laughs> that, that's where people with records are found. And th that's where we need to be doing outreach to people, I think, but Lauren? One thing that I've really enjoyed about the consortium, because we've been working very closely with the Department of Labor, um, the Vermont Department of Labor, on apprenticeships and talking about um, new Americans and um, less so people with criminal backgrounds, but obviously that's been touched on. And also, and we've talked about um, military families to an extent with Fort Drum, because they do a lot of outreach with them. Um, that's a new conversation for OPR. I think. OPR does a lot of amazing things, sometimes in a vacuum um, with ourselves, um, and we wait for people to come to us. So um, I, I do believe that we need to integrate better into the other state agencies. Um, the other state agencies need to be educated about what we do and how we do it. Um, it's a long-term project, and, it, and, it's, and it's harder than it sounds, quite frankly, but um, because you have to start to to train people to, to know where that this is a regulated occupation and that there's a path forward. And um, with all of our professions, um, it's more complicated than it seems at first breath, but um, it's something that is definitely a long-term project. So what I would suggest is um, <clears throat> that if there, are, if there are things that you think statutorily that we can do this year to move, continue to move forward on this, that we, we figure those out and perhaps um, incorporate them into H-289. And, if, and knowing that it's a long-term project that we wouldn't, but if there are some kind of overarching um, things around the best practices that we could do. Um, it, does that make sense, committee, to everybody to do yeah, that and to- That would be great. And then to come back the week of the 6th and 
see if there's anything that we want to try and put in here or not. Or if we want to just continue the conversation and um, get something that we can work on next in January. That makes sense? Yeah, that's great. I'll just Thank add, you. I'm sending an email right now to Michelle and to Joshua um, asking for the best practices so that I can, um, because I didn't have your email and I just want to say thank you, Gail, for giving me the emails. Um, and I will um, email you and ask for our best practice so we can start to engage in a conversation. And if there's easy things that we can do this session, we can add them. Good. That's great. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to it. Yeah, Thank you so much. Lewis, um, I'll my, keep, try and keep my jaw up from now on. <laughs> and we're doing this, you know, judiciary is doing this also with the justice reinvestment and with expungements. And I think this is where this originally came into the conversation was around the expungements. I, but I don't even remember because, but so we're constantly working on this. They kind of go hand in glove. Yeah. Madam Chair, if we're at a yeah. national breaking point, I have kind of a economic development committee related uh, commitment that either Allison and I would need to go to. So and, um, and I, Keisha, if you'd be willing to do it, that would be great. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I I do want to. It's four ten now. We're quite a way behind ourselves. Um, may I, uh, ma'am? Yes. Just excuse myself for one sec for a loo break because uh, I have been sitting here since one, and I. <laughs> um, does anybody else want to let Allison have a loo break? You could all vote on. <laughs> Can we vote on that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we'll take a four minute break. Okay. Thank you for your time, committee. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Laura.